Welcome to Lecture 1 for Advanced Shielded Metal Arc Welding. The coverings on the electrode provide the following. And if you were here last class, basically what I do is one or two days of notes and then we'll have a quiz afterwards. It's going to be on this. So, a potential test question starting right off the bat here. The coverings on the electro provide the following for what? And it'll be, I'll probably say, you know, list five things the coverings on the electro provides. And then you list five things the electro provides, right? Mm -hmm. So, first thing is a gas. to shield the arc and prevent atmospheric contamination through the molten well pool. Everybody knows that with the welding, if you have liquid metal, Gases from the air get into it, and when I and try to or, uh, upon solidification, they try to escape, right, causing porosity. That's why you got to have a sh some kind of shielding for all the, the welding processes, where it goes into a liquid state. There are solid state welding processes where it's not as important, but um, you have to have a shielding to keep them gases from getting into your actual weld. Deoxidizers to react with and deplete the level of dissolved gaseous elements that can cause porosity. Fluxing agents, when you hear fluxing, talk about drawing out the garbage, okay? So fluxing agents to accelerate. That doesn't look right, does it? You made it autocorrected. Huh. To accelerate chemical reactions. Clean the well pool. So again, dry out the garbage. We should then be hit with a chipping hammer. It's going to fall on the floor. And you're going to sweep it up and throw the garbage into the bin at the end of the class. A slag blanket. To protect the hot weld metal from the air and to enhance the mechanical properties. You know what mechanical properties are? Hardness, toughness, tensile strength, right? Bead shape. <coughs> and surface. Cleanliness. Of the weld metal. So a slag blanket to protect the hot weld metal from the air and to enhance the mechanical properties, bead shape, and surface toughness of the weld metal. Slag blanket actually helps it because uh, and big and tig, when you let off the trigger or let off the foot pedal, you hear that 
hiss afterwards. It's got a post purge, right? It's kind of what the post purge is for stick oil. It covers it up, right? So when that weld is still yellow or red hot, it's still going to get contaminated. So a lot of people think that when the slag blanket lifts up, you know what I'm talking about? It lifts up and they, that's not, it's a good weld, right? That's actually not good because it's not protecting the weld. The reason that that lifts up is the usually the joint design. If it's a good joint design, and it's not down in a crack, it'll lift up. But that's not really the sign of a good weld. That's a myth. Looks good. Yeah. People love that, right? They get the flick. <laughs> All I do is flick my welds, you know. I'm so good, I just flick. It's actually bad. You're lifting it up, and it's not covering it. So it's not necessarily bad. It's just, it's not, it's a myth. It's not. <laughs> it doesn't mean you're a good welder if that happens. If I go out there and weld something on a plate right now, I guarantee you it'll lift off somewhere. You know, it's the joint design more. It's like an intro when you were doing that block. The first bead never lifted up, did it? Because it was in that crack, right? It's a fillet weld, so it was in that, you know, those two plates held it together. But when you got about three or four layers up, every one of them popped up, didn't it? It's just because it was, you know, outside of the joint. Alloy elements. So alloy elements are added to the flux to again it'll end up in the weld. So you, it basically, if you're trying to um, make it corrosion resistance, let's just say, they're going to put maybe uh, nickel in there, and then the nickel will get in the weld and prevent it from you know rusting. If I ask for the principal alloying element of, let's say, 4043 aluminum, it can't be aluminum. That's the main element, right? It's got to be something that's way minor as far as percentage that's in it. An alloying element is a smaller part of it. So an alloying element of 4043 aluminum is silicone. They add it to aid in wetting out. That goes into the metal and helps it spread out wet, they call it, wetting out. Um, so it's something that's added to the flux to improve something. Corrosion resistance, maybe hardness. Hard facing is a good one. So they'll put something in there to make it harder. So if you're welding down the bucket of a backhoe or something, you don't want it to wear. They have hard facing electrodes, okay? So alloying elements are something that's put in there. Alloying elements to improve. I already said it to you, The mechanical. Properties of the weld metal. Mechanical pro properties again, talking tensile strength, um, torsion strength, which would be a twist, shear strength. Okay. Here we go. Elements to affect the shape of the weld pool. Two more. Elements that affect wetting. When they say that, it means it's spreading out. It's liquid and it's flowing out, right? You gotta remember, steel is a solid solution. If the atmosphere was 3,000 degrees, it would be a puddle on the floor, right? So it's just a solid solution. Think of it like ice, right? Ice is on an odd one, obviously, because it expands when cold and but whatever. You gotta yeah, think, if the atmosphere was 3,000 degrees, it's a puddle. It would be a pond on the floor, right? So when you're welding, you're basically taking it back to a fluid, right? That's liquid on there. Okay. Elements that affect the wetting of the workpiece. And the viscosity. Of the liquid. 
metal. Viscosity, right? You don't think of steel with viscosity, right? You think of it as a car. Low viscosity, what's that mean? Solid. It's not as... Very no, it's more smooth, like water. So, you gotta think of that like with steel. I know it's tough to think like that, but... Is it more of a gooey, or is it more of like a liquid? Liquid. Well, viscosity? Yeah. That's what viscosity is, isn't it? High viscosity versus low viscosity. Low viscosity. There we go. According to Wikipedia, which is always right, right? Definitely. Can't use it as a source. Can you use it as a source anymore? No, you can't. Still can't? According to Wikipedia, viscosity is the friction between the molecules of the fluid. Fluids with low viscosity have low resistance and shear easily. So that's thin, right? Mm -hmm. And then, where am I at? And the molecules flow quicker. High viscosity fluids move more sluggish and resistance to deformation. So when you're looking at like oil weights, the higher the viscosity, the stickier it is, I guess you could say. It's like the difference between water and honey. Mm -hmm. There you go. You want sticky sometimes though, right? You know, it depends on what you're doing. Like doing like overhead or something. With, with steel, the wetting means a better viscosity. It moves out easier, right? Lost it, lost it. Arc stabilizers. Has anybody ever um, froze an electrode and then tried to restart it? Yes. Probably. It's all erratic, right? It's not stable at all. It's like uh, Darth Vader's sword thingy. Yeah. Light, lightsaber? There you go. Arc yeah. stabilizers aid in keeping that arc going, all right? To help? Establish the desirable electrical characteristics of the electrode and minimize spattering. So there, you know, you don't think about the spattering aspect of it too. But if you have have something that needs to be aesthetically beautiful, you can't have spatter all over it, right? I've got a part of my truck right now. There's spatter all over. I welded it with sixty ten about this far away. And I couldn't even see what I was doing. It's a plow. Wire wheel. That'll take it off because uh, sixty ten really doesn't get hard fuse spatter. To, you know, it's little tiny sparks. But the arc stabilizers aid in not getting spatter. What do you do? Put a new wear bar on there or something? Huh? Put a new wear bar on it or something? It's a retrofit. I'll show you when we get out there. Right, put the nuts on it. Cut that off. Process advantages. What did I just say I was doing? Golden on a plow frame, right? Was I in a shop or was I out in the field? Probably outside, I don't know. outside right? Is that one of them? It should be. Notice the farmer's mower. Equipment is relatively expensive. Simple. Think about how simple it is. It's a positive and a negative coming together, right? There's no dry rolls. There's no. And sometimes, if you're feeling like having a fun day, you can switch to AC. AC gets a little erratic. Inexpensive. That's why I said having a fun day. That gets rid of arc blow though. So if you have arc blow, you can switch to AC. And here we go. Portable. And. So when I got out of work yesterday, went to my house, grabbed a tractor, threw a generator roller in the back, 
told my neighbor to have it all ready to go. Went there, tacked it all up with stick, threw it in the back of my truck, and now it's coming in here today to finish. Right? Oh, so they can bring something, but I can't. Yep, that's correct. <laughs> he is the teacher. So if you said you wanted to bring a plow in, I'd probably like it. You should have said it. It's close enough. It's going to be a plow. I'm Take a picture of it and bring it in next time and I'll look at it. It's just a bear frame. Take a picture of it. On wheels. Yeah. So it's portable, right? And all people say it's not an expensive. One of those welders out there costs like five, six, seven grand, somewhere around there. Think about what a, a water jet costs. hundred grand, bare bones, right? That's why they're comparing it with the industry stuff. I realize that you probably don't have seven grand right. kicking around and just go buy a welder, but um, compared to other equipment, it's pretty inexpensive. Go find a Loomis truck. What? Go find a Loomis truck. Go find a Loomis truck. Oh, yeah. I've got this old Dayton Walker. I'm trying to rob a Loomis truck. Loomis truck. Yeah. Lost it. Okay. A SMAW. Okay, Electrode. Provides both the shielding as well as the filler. I have to do that job, I had a rubber band of electrodes this big that I took out of there, stuck in my pocket. Pretty simple, right? If you're thinking about a major take, and I'll take the filler metal's not the problem, it's the, it's the gas, right? Mm -hmm. You gotta lug a bottle around. Auxiliary. Maybe get yourself an end card. Gas. What do you think we are? Shielding. Or granular. Oh my. Flux is not required. So you don't need the bottle, and well, granular flux would be a sub arc, right? Submerged arc welding is not underwater welding. It is a mechanical process where a wire comes down and the flux buries the elect or buries the uh, arc, so you don't see it. It's submerged under the flux, and granular flux just pours on it as it's doing the weld. Used for uh, big gaps, huge amounts of wire going. Some of them had three, four wires going into it at the same time. Tandem. Is there anyone I'm talking about? Or you completely, you have no idea? No. Check this out. Did you think submerged arc welding was underwater welding? No. No? Justin wants to be an underwater welder. Yeah, Justin wants to be a lot of welders. He can't get class. He's sleeping. What? How do you come about to be an underwater welder? You gotta go to diamond school after you leave here. Right there. See that flux? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a big ass wire coming down through there. It's welding and this thing is spinning as it's doing it. It's resurfacing it. Well, it's like an They're almost, they built up right there. Hmm. Could you imagine doing that by hand? Uh, it's, uh, I mean, I'd go for the right So, so what is it now? It's basically a MIG welder that's on steroids. Is it like a robot? It's, is it a robotic MIG? It's a, um, there, you know there's machine, wait a minute here, there's manual, semi-automatic, machine, and then automatic. Automatic's a robot, manual is stick and tape. Semi-automatic is MIG. This is machine. So, Which we go over all that. It's, so it's robotic. It, it's close to a robot. It's the equivalent of the track cutter. Okay. The track cutter is a machine process. Yep. You start it and put it in the where it's going and then it does it. Mm -hmm. Then you gotta turn it off and all that. This is the same thing, it's a machine process. So a lot of times if they're resurfacing round things, they'll do that right there. You see this thing right here is a vacuum. It's sucking up the excess granules. I'm trying to find. There's a good one. See how big that joint is. Let's see if it has a. Wow, the picture's not even on here after I clicked it. Well, I'll get out of here, I guess. So you see that huge V groove right there? They're filling it in the sub arc. There it is again, that's the vacuum, sucking it up. Did you see a video of it? Are they able to reuse it? Yeah, 
they put it through a filter and then mm -hmm. use it. And then, yeah, see they're doing the end of a, looks like a tank. What's the video? Let's watch that one. Where? They threw a tank. The YouTube one? Yeah. That's spinning. All you see is uh, what are those little grains? That's granular flux. Comes mm -hmm. like feed bags. That's all we see is that and the Yeah, the weld taking place underneath. Yeah, it's underneath that. So it's basically covered. It's the same thing as stick welding, it's just well as far as the flux it goes, you chip it when it's done. It's a big thick flux too. It's like, Kind of on that guy. Sure, it's over. There's the wall. Oh, okay. You know how long it would take you to fill that by hand? A while. I was hoping they would show you a check. About as long as it takes the peak check soon as the finish the next project. They must have been it again. They go over at play. Apparently. Yeah. 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 There's two wires going down into it. That wire is like five thirty seconds of an inch, huge. And, so, and it runs like a MIG machine. It's got a big spool of it, and it just cranks it down into it. They have ones with three, four wires going into it, just filling huge sections. Right there's one of the three. See it? When I worked at Esau, they had those. And I want to say they had four or five wires going into it. We were just ripping it. Submerge arc welding. Slag. You should see the slag. It's really. There it is. Really thick. That they're going to throw out. For the, stuff, the other flux that didn't use, they're going to um, throw on the filter and reuse it. Yeah. I was going to say, I feel like they'd be pouring it in pretty quick. There's a whole bucket of it. So it's a lot thicker than the stick welding. Need a damn hopper for that. That's the granular flux that they're talking about right here. <laughs> that was a good sidetrack. It wasn't totally off topic. Hmm? It, like, it wasn't like we're talking about how cooks running back, stiff arm somebody, but then it got called back anyway. So it really, did it really happen? Not a week ago. Here we go. That has nothing to do with anything, right? The process is less sensitive like to wind, wind or drafts. Or drafts. <laughs> Again, conducive to outside welding, right? Stick welding applications. I mean, you think about where it's actually done. It's done in pipelines. It's done in iron workers. Um, maintenance, that's the main applications for it, right? You're not going to go to a factory and produce something with a stick weld. That's just stupid. Okay. You're going to make it every time because the productivity is low, right? If you're outside though, you're going to need to use stick weld. And even like the iron workers do a lot of flux core now because the productivity is there with the flux core. Um, Pipe liners are a huge application for stick welding. And every maintenance garage in the world has a stick welder in the corner. Usually it's in the shape of a tombstone, right? Everybody knows that welder, right? Yeah. So I got four Stick welding a lot of times for maintenance is your last ditch efforts. Your you know it's the last thing you do. Any of the construction workers, stick welding, right? 
Steve Vitters. Mm -hmm. I always think of iron workers, you know, on I beams and things like that. You're not going to be worried about changing your shielding gas, right? <laughs> uh, the process is flexible. And can be applied to a variety. Joint configurations. And this is according to the book, Optimal Results. Can be reliably obtained. Limitations or disadvantages, right? Same thing. What did we just say a minute ago? Why wouldn't you use it in a production setting if you didn't? It's a dirty process, you gotta clean it. Productivity, right? That's another shipping of slag, right? So, production, well, productivity. It's not the most productive process. What would you just say, dirty, chipping of slag? You know how long you can turn chipping, of a, or chipping slag into? <laughs> you could be there for five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. and that goes into the productivity again, too. You get a drum fire when you're done. Metals with lower melting temperature. Whoops, I was getting close to being where I needed to be. Are you going to weld something that's under eighth of an inch with this? No. They do have rod that is really small. We have sixteenth of an inch out there. It would weld that. But why would you do that if you had a mini welder or a tape welder, right? Aluminum. You can weld it with stick, but it's like rubbing two sticks together. We're not going to hand you a Zippo, right? We have. Fancy welders out there that weld aluminum, like, whoo, real nice. You're not going to stick weld aluminum unless you're in a maintenance setting. If you look at the light poles over there, maintenance guys tend to shear those off two, two or three a year when they're plowing. And you'll see the ones that they fixed with a stick welder, and then you'll see the ones that we fixed. And it'll be a big old weaved weld because usually they've already fixed it once. So there's this really nasty stick weld that's down there. And we take our fancy welders and we just melt that all together in a big blend. If you look at the light poles, you'll see them. The weld's about that wide, the face of it. Oh, yeah, I see it. So that's just because they sheared them off and they fixed it before with a stick welder. So metals with lower, with lower melting temperature. And you got to run it on AC so that the heat gets all weird, right? Because when you're rolling on AC, it goes back and forth. So it's 50% on, 50% off. I wonder if they just call you guys the first time. Because the welding program wasn't around. We started in 04, I think they started this program. So before that, there was no welders here. So, so are you saying like stick welding is like the Raiders of the NFL? Oh. <laughs> are you out of your mind? <laughs> How, how hard I, I like stick welding myself. I'm not putting I, it down. I, I like I'm just saying it's very it. limited in what it's used for. But the people that get that actually use it, they get paid a lot of money. Yeah, like Mike welders, they get paid seventy bucks an hour. You know, I mean, very more than that. You know, the the trade unions, you get into them, you're making thirty five topped out. You know, so the places where it is used, you're getting a lot of money. I think it gets a, it might get a bad reputation because of the maintenance aspect. Because usually maintenance guys, 
They know a lot about a little bit. Wait a minute. They know a little bit about, a little bit about a lot of stuff, but they're they're you know they're a mile wide and an inch deep instead of being focused into one thing. Good maintenance departments have a guy that's been really good at electrical, a, a guy that's been really good at hydraulic, a guy that's been really good at welding, a guy that's been really good at machine. Let's say they have seven or eight guys in one, and each person is you know good at one thing. Because then you have a team aspect for maintenance where you can tackle just about anything. But there's a lot of maintenance people that I'm going to try and fix this because that's what I'm going to try and do, and I don't really know what I'm doing. And I'm not saying that about our maintenance department or any maintenance department in particular, but a good maintenance department, they have a bunch of people that are good at one thing and then know a lot about a little bit, a little bit about a lot of other things, if that makes sense. So. The term, I know just enough about this to be dangerous. You ever heard that term? Mm -hmm. So that's lost it, lost it, stub loss. We were talking about that last class. You know, when people don't use the entire electrode, right? That's just money that you flush down the, the, the pipeline, right? You know how long you take to take, take that one stub out and put a new electrode in? You can turn that in an hour, right? Mm -hmm. You've done well, you put it over your leg, and well, it's chipped for a little bit. And my wire brush. I don't know where that is. I'll be right back. I gotta grab my wire brush. <laughs> right? Huh. I didn't quite get that piece. Huh. Just get a wire it's reel. Great time to clean up. Yeah. Right. Just get a wire reel. Where's my new electro? I'll be right that. You know what they call that? Operator factor. Right in the clock. <laughs> the operator factor for stick welding is horrible because of all that I was just talking about. Right? Of loss of our time, right? Let's say you just got done watching the Super Bowl when you know the Titans lost on the half yard line. Let's say you're a Titans fan and you, you're so depressed that you went to the store and got a 12 pack of Milwaukee's Beast Ice and you polished that baby off. And then you went to stick weld the next day. You know what you can turn your operator factor into? Changing of electrodes, shipping of slag, you're a little slow because the Titans blew it on the half yard line. It's a very tough thing to deal with as a Titans fan, right? Your operator factor can go through the roof, right? You can weld four or five electrodes in half a day, right? So that's why when they do uh, stick welding calculations as far as cost, the operator factor goes way up. This is why robotics is taking over, right? Because there is no operator factor. Does a robot ever get tired? No. Does a robot ever come in hung over because the Titans blew the game? No. Right? They're just going to keep going and going and going. So. Are you a Titans fan? I am. He is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's the robot fan. <laughs> is there a robot stick one? No. I think so. That'd be a cool thing to do. Right. You'd have to somehow program it to, to, go to know that the electrode was getting eaten <laughs> as it was yeah. going. All right. Yeah. Yeah. If the arc temperature gets too high, and I had this happen last class, I was freezing a lot at 70 degrees for the root pass on the Psych 6010. And this kid had bad fit up, so he had a, a small face on it. And I put it at 60 and it ran better at 60 because and it wasn't sticking and that was because it was prematurely burning up the electrode. So if the arc temperature gets high, it will prematurely melt the electrode covering, ruining the good arc characteristics. Usually that happens on 6010 because the covering is a cellulose plant-based 
um, flux. Wood. Wood is no good, right? It burns. Well, 718 is a mineral based flux, so it doesn't do it as bad with 718. 6010 is when it does it. It'll be walling along and everything's perfect, and it freezes. You have prematurely burnt your covering, right? I did that yesterday when I was doing the plow blade. I couldn't see what I was doing, you know what I mean? And I had to keep going out and in and out and in, and then all of a sudden it froze, and then I couldn't get it off. And that reminds me, when you freeze an electrode, that electricity is still flowing through it, and it's basically getting hotter and hotter and hotter because of the electrical resistance, right? Low hydrogen electrodes, do we know what these are? Somebody quick, say 7018. 7018. Yeah, you're the man. You got her, 7018. Low hydrogen electrodes. You ever notice opening up the box of 7018 is, is like very difficult? It's hermetically sealed because it can't have hydrogen get in there. So once the hermetically sealed container is broken, oh, I butchered that. Once the hermetically sealed container is open, we'll say, it must be baked. That's what that oven is in the very back. I think it's plugged in. It's plugged in. I keep plugging it in every day because people don't keep unplugging it because of the grinders. I'm going to have to run a cord up and around so it has its own. Anyways, it's supposed to be plugged in. It's 7018 goes in it. Do not put 6010 in it. If you put 6010 in it, it'll dry it out. We had 6010 on day, I was welded, I could not get it, it would weld about three, four inches and it would freeze no matter what temperature you had it on. And I'm like, man, what the heck is going on? And then I opened up the, the oven and they had it in the oven. It ruins it. So I don't put 6010 in the oven, only 7018. We'll Good. talk a little bit more about this in a second here when we're off camera. Good way to pull a crank on someone. Screw it all in the room. <laughs> The electrodes must be baked at a temperature of at least 250 degrees American. Our note taking for lecture number one.